Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Sara Taisir. I'm a pediatrics and neonatology consultant and healthcare consultant on uh, MedSynapse Medical Platform. Today I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Maha El Asar as my dear guest. Uh, Dr. Mahal Asar is a consultant uh, of radiology, consultant radiologist, uh, nuclear medicine and GI imaging, and HA Trust UK. Welcome, Dr. Maha, on board. Thank you, Dr. Sara. We're so happy to have you today. First of all, before starting our uh, very interesting topic, I need to know more about your medical background, please. Thank you very much for your invitation to start. And um, uh, I'm a consultant radiologist in the NHS Trust UK. Currently, I was, uh, I'm also an assistant uh, professor of uh, diagnostic radiology and nuclear medicine at Shams University, Cairo, Egypt. Um, um, I, I had my MD degree in 2019, passed my FRCR examination in uh, 2021. Okay, great experience. Thank you. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the PET MRI in dementia. Let me start with my first question is, what is the definition of dementia? And uh, if you can give us Kida, like an idea about the epidemiology. Yes, sure. So dementia is a neurodegenerative disorder, which is characterized by global cognitive decline, which is causing functional impairment. Dementia currently uh, presents a massive burden on the society and is expected to increase as you know, as the population yeah. ages. The prevalence of uh, dementia is that uh, around 55 million people worldwide now are living with dementia and nearly 10 million new cases every year. In 2019, the annual cost of dementia was estimated at $1.3 trillion. Dementia is still considered as the seventh leading cause of death globally. And women, unfortunately, are disproportionately affected as patients as patients as well as caregivers, providing around 70% of care hours for people living with dementia. Okay. And doctor, regarding the PET MRI, what is the PET MRI? Can you just explain more to the audience what is what is PET MRI and how does it differ from the traditional MRI scans? Yes, sure. So PET stands for positron emission tomography and MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, to make okay. it as simple as possible, Traditional MRI scans would use magnetic fields and radio waves to create a detailed image of the brain. However, PET scans would use a radioactive tracer and this is able to visualize metabolic processes at a cellular level. Yeah. So the combination of PET MRI, which we consider as a hybrid form of uh, imaging, provides both the structural as well as the functional information in a single scan. Okay, so it's more detailed? Yes. Okay. So um, can you explain the role of the PET MRI in the diagnosis of dementia since we're talking today about the dementia? Yes, sure. So we do consider lots of imaging techniques or lots of modes of diagnosing for dementia. However, if we speak about PET MRI, it plays a crucial role in diagnosing dementia by allowing the clinicians to observe both, as I said, the structural changes in the brain and as well as the metabolic changes within the brain. Yeah. So the dual approach uh, would help clinicians further identify different types of dementia mm -hmm. as the regional cerebral uh, blood flow reduced and the glucose uptake is reduced in cases, for example, such as Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And how does PET-MRI help differentiate between different types of dementia, such as you, you just said Alzheimer's disease and, uh, for example, frontotemporal dementia? Yes. So if we take AD as or Alzheimer's disease is considered to be the most common type of dementia, counting for around 60% of the cases. Yeah. Um, this is followed actually by vascular dementia and then by FTLD or also known as a frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Yeah. So the pathophysiology is quite different. In Alzheimer's disease, there is accumulation of what is called the amyloid plaques as well as neurofibrillary tangles. And in FTLD, you find that there is no amyloid burden. However, there is neurofibrillary tangle formation. FDG PET, as well as PET MRI using other PET ligands, can actually discriminate between both types very easily. So if we take the most prevalent type of PET, which is actually uh, more available uh, all mm -hmm. over the world, which is FDG, you do have a specific pattern of uh, glucose hypometabolism in AD, okay. for example, within the mesial temporal lobes. However, mm. in FTLD, it's more likely to be affecting the frontal lobes, temporal and parietal sparing. Okay, now it's uh, it's clear how to differentiate between uh, the different types. And how early can PET-MRI detect signs of uh, cognitive decline in individual at risk for dementia? So uh, it's quite nice to know that 
the pathological changes in the cases of dementia precede the symptoms by around 15 to 20 years. Okay. So if we imagine that a patient usually passed through a preclinical stage and then this is followed by what is called the mild cognitive impairment stage and then they establish dementia. So you do know that there are a few steps with lot maybe a two decades until the dementia is established. And actually the two first stages, which are the preclinical stage as well as the mild cognitive impairment stage, these are the ones that are targeted by PET mm. imaging. So. Okay. Uh, to be, uh, to be, uh, one of the most important things to know is that FDG PET has a very high sensitivity of about 94.7% and a very high specificity of about 80.5%, as you will be seeing on the slides. And this is in the detection of mesial temporal lobe hypermetabolism, and this would furthermore predict the cognitive decline. Okay, and is there some signs for a person to know that he's going to uh, through the, 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 the first phase of dementia? If, for example, I, I have, uh, what symptoms can I have uh, to think that mm -hmm. I might have dementia as a normal person? Yes, okay, so it's a good question. Uh, as I mentioned, in a preclinical stage, there are no symptoms at all. You okay. can't actually know if this mm -hmm. patient is going to develop dementia in the future or not. Okay. However, the second stage, which is called the mild cognitive impairment stage, these, this we define as mild, very mild symptoms of cognitive impairment. Okay. However, they still do not interfere with the everyday activities. Mm -hmm. When the patient establishes dementia or when dementia is fully established, these symptoms become very severe such as memory problems, maybe some yeah. somatic disorders, some uh, sensory uh, changes. And this is furthermore graded into mild, moderate and severe. Okay, I understand. And uh, can PET MRI be used to monitor the progression of dementia over time? Yes. So I would like to say one thing about PET MRI, especially using FDG as a ligand. Normal findings on an FDG PET in a patient who is suspected to have maybe the prodroma or the preclinical and MCI stages can actually, if the PET CT is, if the PET MRI uh, FDG base is negative, hmm. this would suggest that the pathological progression in the cognitive impairment during the subsequent three years is highly unlikely to occur. Okay. So if we have a normal distribution of FDG within the brain, then we're quite happy to know that this patient will not have any cognitive impairment, at least in the subsequent okay. three years. Mm -hmm. Also to know that FDG PET as well is a very using PET, PET MRI with amyloid mm -hmm. ligands. If the scan is negative, so there is no finding suggestive of an amyloid burden on that scan, then this reliably would rule out Alzheimer's disease in particular. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is there uh, some people who cannot do the PET MRI? Are there any limitations or drawback to using PET MRI for dementia diagnosis? Well, uh, you know, PET MRI is still a hybrid type of imaging, which is still not very well known all over the world. Okay. Uh, most of the cases are still under research, clinical trials and things like that. However, I think like any new imaging modality, for example, if we remember PET-CT when it was first introduced, yeah. one of the most important, not drawbacks, but limitations are the very high cost of this technique, the limited availability, the need for specialized equipment and expertise. However, also some patients also may not be very eligible to take radioactive tracers. So there mm -hmm. are a few things, but I think the most common and the most uh, standing out is the high cost and the limited availability if we're speaking about PET MRI in particular. Okay, and how do you see the future of PET MRI contributing in the dementia research and treatment? What are the applications of PET MRI that can be used in this field? So the future applications, I'd say the sky's the limit, you know, so <laughs> yeah. for, really, so for PET MRI, um, Every day there's a new tracer, every day something is being targeted in the brain to be able to detect these patients as early as possible. And for dementia in particular, um, there's development of new tracers to target different biomarkers within the brain. Yeah. Improving the early detection methods is still very important, as I mentioned, and stressed on throughout our discussion. Mm -hmm. And of course, enhancing the understanding of the disease mechanism is still, it's still vague. Yeah. Many things are still not known. And so if we do use these new and potentially important PET MRI techniques, I think it will help us understand lots of things regarding the disease mechanism. And this will take me actually to the next question, which is how might advancement in PET MRI technology improve the accuracy of and accessibility of dementia diagnosis? So as we just mentioned, one of the drawbacks maybe is the uh, is the availability. So again, 
being more available is one of the things that uh, would make it um, it's a bit challenging more. i guess doctor uh, it, it, it's not available uh, in every definitely. country yes. definitely yes but the good news is that you know instead of having the whole machine which is the pet mri machine to the two what they call a, a one-stop shop machine mm. which does both techniques together now we can actually go for mri of the brain the usual mri of the brain mm. with a multi-parametric approach and then we can actually use some softwares to combine that okay. with fdg pet of the brain so at this point you you can make it relatively available by some local softwares that are being used as usual in PET CT, for yeah, example. Yeah, this is helpful, yes. Yes, and of course, uh, we can't forget in this era that artificial intelligence softwares imaging techniques yes. now, they started enhancing the standard MRI scans by providing more detailed volumetric analysis of the brain structures, exactly. also segmenting and quantifying the volumes of various brain structures, then comparing these volumetric studies with a database of normal values that are based on the patient's age, gender, and cranial volume. Yes, yes, completely. I agree with you. And uh, it was a very interesting podcast, Doctor. It's, um, we, we learned a lot about the M M PET MRI because honestly, uh, as you said, it's not very, very well known now, especially in, like, you know, the Arabic countries, Egypt might be available at some uh, places, but not all around. So the part of you mentioning the software that we can use just the normal MRI and then use a software that would be available for everyone to maybe uh, yes. have better diagnosis and then better treatment. So this is really helpful. I'm so happy to have, we had this conversation today and we had this podcast and uh, definitely we'll have another uh, talks together soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Maha, for having you on uh, MedSignups Medical Platform. Uh, thank you so much for your invitation and your professionality and to say this is just a glimpse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in, of course. <laughs> in dementia diagnosis and in PET imaging. And you definitely, we definitely need many, many talks to cover yes, the Yes, because <laughs> I guess many of the doctors, especially junior doctors, will uh, benefit a lot from uh, this one. So uh, we will need you to like uh, give juniors more and more talks about radiology in general. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice day.